Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. In part one of this presentation, Thunderbolts contributor archaeologist Peter Mungo Jupp began his comprehensive analysis on the nature of comets, including the Electric Universe perspective that comets are not four and a half billion year old icy leftovers of the early solar system. Included in his analysis, Jupp presented outtakes of his interview with physicist Wal Thornhill, recorded a few years ago, discussing Thornhill's perspective on comet origins. In this episode, we begin with Thornhill explaining why the notion of comets as sublimating ice balls cannot explain most comet activity. Uh, the other thing is that if you have one of these objects, if it was just a ball of icy dust, approaching the sun, what would happen is that the ice would turn to a gas and it should yeah. just blow off like a kind of a wind. But that's not what we see. We see these very well-defined jets. And we also see bright spots on the nucleus when they photograph the nucleus. Okay. And uh, those bright spots are unexplained. But in the electrical model, of course, that is the point where the arcs are coming from. Okay, yep. And that's from within the comet itself. And is this the reason you get this huge tail of discharge on the comet? Is that It's one of the reasons or? why you get these well collimated jets of very fine material because it's uh, the sort of technique used in electrical sputtering, the coating of astronomical uh, mirrors and so on, yeah. where you just take atoms at a time off a, surface, off a cathode and then attract them towards a charged surface or you just have them floating in space if you like and then they uh, land on the uh, mirror, the glass surface, right. and form this coating of metal just a few atoms thick. And so these atoms are shunted way out in space on the tail of the comet? Yes, and they're... And they're phosphorescing, if we want a better word, or... Well, they're, they're glowing, glowing because they're an electrical discharge, yeah. yeah. Uh, and the, um, the trajectory that they take is that which is also seen in the laboratory in an electrical discharge, okay. this parabolic curve. Uh, and there's plenty of evidence that this is the kind of um, th thing we should expect. For instance, on Io, the so-called volcanoes of Io, they too are cathode jets. Oh, and right, the, right. they're very distinctive in that, unlike any volcano known on Earth, they deposit their material in a ring. But this is characteristic of an electrical discharge because okay. it sorts the material according to atomic or molecular weight. Okay. And uh, it follows a, a distinct trajectory. Okay, now, so we've got a little bit of the nature of the comet now, which is basically a negatively charged body moving towards the sun. Mm. And something else happens then. It can either go past the sun, it can split and explode, just like uh, Shoemaker-Levy did, 9 did, when it impacted on, or mm. Flash impacted, I like to call it, on Jupiter. Mm. Or it can actually hit the sun. Now, what happens when it hits the sun? Well, this is, we've got photos or movies of this sort of thing, and usually it seems. Yes, well, the electrical influence of a comet extends to the uh, boundary of its coma. And the coma of some comets, like the recent one of Hartley, uh, was bigger than the sun. So this, right? this tiny lump of rock has an electrical influence which extends over a vast volume. So they're incredibly powerful compared to their physical size. Absolutely. And so you can understand then that that uh, intrusion of a charged body near a charged sun can give rise to a sudden discharge from the sun. In other words, a coronal mass ejection. Okay, and that's on the opposite side of the sun, or at least the films I've seen. Well, actually, you get uh, effects occurring on opposite sides of the sun almost simultaneously, yeah, which it's, it's is absolutely impossible if the sun is powered internally. Yep, yeah. However, if the sun is an electrical body, that is possible because the influences are coming from outside and they can be synchronised uh, electrically. So this huge uh, corona, I think you called it, as, as it flies towards the sun, mm. is exhibiting a, a massive impact, effect, not impact effect, or discharge effect on the sun. Yes. And this coronal mass ejection is nearly as big as the sun in some cases, if not bigger. Oh, they're, yeah, they're huge, yeah. So the, the puny little comet isn't quite so puny. And, and carry on this thing, when Shoemaker-Levy 9 
split into 23 pieces as it headed towards Jupiter. On the first go around Jupiter, it split up. Ah, that's yeah. when it split into the 23 yeah. sections. And then it went into an orbit where they were able to predict now, that it would Now, you think this split impact. up is another electrical phenomenon? Sure. Comets uh, inexplicably uh, split and uh, fragment as they cross the ecliptic, usually, uh, which is the current sheet of the sun or when they're approaching the sun, when the voltage on the surface is changing rapidly. Uh, and the reason for that is that any body in the universe uh, of any considerable mass will have a, an internal gravitational field, albeit may be weak, but that gravitational field will offset all of the uh, positively charged particles, which are heavier, more massive, mm -hmm. towards mm -hmm. the centre of the object, and the electrons will then adopt elliptical orbits with the nucleus at a focus which is nearer the centre. In other words, every atom in that object will be a tiny electric dipole. Okay. So every object of any considerable size in the universe will uh, have the characteristics of an electret, which is an object which maintains an electric field. Right, that's an interesting term, electret. Electret, so... yeah. Uh, so a comet uh, if sufficient charge is either removed or added to one of these bodies, uh, it can cause uh, internal discharges through the body of the comet. And yeah. this is what I call earthquake. This is the harbinger of an earthquake. Now, okay. on a small body like a comet, that earthquake is sufficient to shatter it quite often. So this is the effect of the electrical effect? Yeah, this internals. is the electrical effect, yep. yeah. I mean, the same thing happens on Earth. Earthquakes are underground lightning. Right, precisely. Mm. So uh, that explains the fragmentation um, and the very fine particles that you see in the jets and that are all just part of this uh, whole electrical aspect of uh, comets. So we have some good ideas as to how comets are created by ejection from say Jupiter, Saturn etc. And we have some understanding about their electrical nature. But what about what we now know is its rocky terrain? Gone are the days of the farcical, dusty, snowball comet. If, for instance, we take Comet P69 as an example, there is no doubt its topography closely resembles that of many planets such as Mercury and Mars. It's complete with valleys, electrical erosion, sand fields and rocky outcrops. But comets, unlike major planets and most moons, are not spherical. We're not sure why, but in fact a large percentage of imaged comics and their similar sisters, asteroids, have nuclear that are double, even triple lobed. Now where have I seen this before? Many comets and asteroids have a remarkable similarity to the thunder egg seen on Earth. And if, as Wald Thornall often says, electrical phenomena are scalable, we may have an example on a much smaller scale of a comet structure. Creation of similar tectikes by C.J. Ransom in the Vermisat laboratories by electrical discharge may hold the key to an understanding of both asteroids, comets and planets. Now, thunder egg rocks come in an incredible array. Look at these ones I'm about to show you. Some are hollow. Some have crystalline interiors, some have gaseous enclosures, and some are filled with liquid. Star-shaped interiors, you name it. Depending on the layer the thunder eggs were found in, rapid progression from spherical to double and triple lobe rocks develop. I'll uh, just read you a little bit from Robert Colburn, who wrote, if you like, the quintessential information on thunder eggs. This is his uh, quote on the formation of thunder eggs. On the bedrock, in contrast with the ashy clay, some eggs could be pried off whole, with more melded into doubles, triples, or even clusters. Most broke apart, revealing a hollow top consisting of a thin layer of chalconi coating the walls of the egg's interior. Horizontally banded Waterline opal is contained within the thin concentric layer and occupying from one quarter 
to one half of the interior at the bottom, with the tops being flat floors, some with chalky surfaces that can be scraped with a fingernail. Perhaps we can get closer to understanding thunder eggs by approaching them as gas cavities filled with water-based minerals, like those of amygdaloids, an idea fairly well accepted by most geologists. An amygdaloid is a mineral-filled gas cavity found in basalt and andesite lava. So let's begin with a question. How homogeneous is the Earth? And for that matter, comets and meteors. Is it moulded within by strict circular boundaries? Or is it perhaps like the internals of this classic thunder egg with a 3 d stamped shaped interior? Plasma pioneers such as C.J. Ransham, remember, recreated spherical Martian rock blueberries in the lab with electrical discharge techniques. Were thunder eggs created by similar measures? And if electrical f effects are scalable, could our larger Earth body perhaps replicate a thunder egg formation with its gaseous enclosures and spiky outreaches that may perhaps resemble the jets of a comet. Now let's take this a little further. Thomas Gold, in his book, The Deep Biosphere, makes a strong case for the intervention of gas upwelling as a powerful but neglected process in the workings of large hydrocarbon deposits, either gaseous, liquid or solid, from deep within our own Earth. But perhaps even Gold failed to realise effects of electrical telluric currents swayed by cosmic effects as the primal cause of the chaotic meandering of gases and liquids within charged bodies. Were they the agent that caused cometary instabilities? As Walt Thornhill has always pointed out, the planets, comets and asteroids are electrets or charged bodies revolving in a constantly changing cosmic electromagnetic environment. They thus react with other charged bodies working towards electrical equilibrium. Thus our big question, could common interiors also possess hydrocarbon enclosures, the kerogens, oil, coal, etc.? Nicolas Beaver of the Paris Observatory France, lead author of a paper on the discovery published October 23rd, in uh, science, advances found that Comet Lovejoy was releasing as much alcohol as at least 500 bottles of wine every second during its peak activity. The team found 21 different organic molecules in gas from the comet, including ethyl alcohol and glycol aldehyde, a simple sugar. Further, in July... The European Space Agency reported that the Philae lander from its Rosetta spacecraft in orbit around Comet 67P detected 16 organic compounds as it descended toward and then bounced across the comet's surface. According to the agency, some of the compounds detected play key roles in the creation of amino acids, nucleobases and sugars from simple the building block molecules. So where does this all lead us? We've certainly learned the comet is an electrical phenomena. We've learned that it's not a dusty snowball, it's solid. It moves in elliptical orbits of various combinations. But most important of all, I believe the next comet revelation will be the fact that it sustains the molecules of life, the carbohydrates, the hydrocarbons, the kerogens, coal, oil, methane, gases contained within the body of the comet. These are common fundamentals of the solar system. Perhaps we're seeing a travelling Z pitch, creating all the molecules necessary for life and the fundamentals of this solar system.